All right, you guys, let's open our Bibles. We're going to go to uh, the book of Luke. Luke chapter 9 is where we're going to be this morning. We're going to continue our series of, uh, that we've been looking at in the month of January on being children of God. <clears throat> and, you know, it doesn't take you very long if you look around at your world and your culture to see how, how self-crazed we are. You know, phrases like self-realization, self-actualization, self-awareness, self-esteem. Um, you've heard these phrases, be the best version of yourself. Uh, you be you. Follow your heart are all terms that we've heard and seen in our culture everywhere. And that to go along with the social media crazed world that we live in from YouTube influencers to Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook rants to a really interesting statistic this week that I read was that we take on average as humans 93 million selfies per day. If you don't know what a selfie is, I need to figure that one out, but it's where they take your phone, you turn it on you, and you take a picture of yourself. 93 million per day. And yet, you look around your world, and it seems like it hasn't served us very well. I follow uh, athletics and sports a lot, and I like to read up on contract negotiations, and I like to read about how guys are seeing teamwork and all sorts of things, and, and over the last 20 years, there's been certain phrases that have come out of the sports world that I think are really interesting, things like, I got to get mine, when they talk about their money or they talk about their stats. Um, in the philosophy world, in the psychological world, it's told and known very clearly that the best thing you can do for yourself is to love yourself first. And yet, all that's done is create a society and a world that looks out for me, myself, and I. And yet, at the same time, we are the most miserable, angry, discontented, and jealous people than we've ever been. <laughs> and what's crazy about it is, this hasn't just hit us, right? This has been centuries in the making. I think it's really important to realize that we're, we're not even at the apex of what this self-industry is going to do to us. But the question is, in my mind, I ask why? Why, why is it if we... If, we, if loving ourselves is supposedly the happiest way to live, why are we so miserable? And I think Scripture gives us a really good reason why. It's because we were not made to love ourselves. We were made to primarily love God and love others, and in doing so, we find love for ourselves. We find fulfillment. We find happiness. We find joy, and we certainly will find satisfaction in the life to come. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. I want to talk about this as our series of being children of God. We've seen in this series that being children of God means that we have been adopted into God's family through Christ. It means that we are Christ's representatives on this earth, meaning that what we do with our lives and our jobs and our families and our neighborhoods represents Jesus, and we've seen that we've been set free from the power and the penalty of sin by the life and death of Jesus Christ. But today we're going to see something else, and if you're new with us, you should have got a bulletin when you walked in the door, and on the back side of that bulletin is an outline, and this is the big idea of the day that we want to hit on today. Because we are children of God, we value Jesus more than our lives. Because we're children of God, we value Jesus more than our lives. And what I hope to see, and what I think we're going to see is, is that this really is the pathway to true happiness. So let's stand together and let's read Luke 9, 23 through 26. Luke 9, 23 through 20, 26. We, we stand because this is God's word. We honor it. And this is the reading of God's inspired word to us. Luke 9, verse 23. And he, that's Jesus, said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed. When he comes in his glory, in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. 
Let's pray. Father, we are so inundated with self that it is so challenging for us to even hear the kind of things we're going to hear today because it just feels like it's from another world, and in reality, it is. So today, would you open our eyes to the power of your supernatural grace to restore us to our true humanity in Christ? And then, Father, would you, would you help us to see truly Jesus is the pearl of great price, that there is no greater treasure than Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of all things. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. <clears throat> now, this text is an interesting one because in it, like really no other place that you'll find, Jesus tells us explicitly what it means to be one of his disciples. You'll notice how verse 23 begins. And he, Jesus, said to all, if anyone would come after me. And when you look at the context of Luke chapter 9, you can see why he said this. If you've got your Bibles, pull those back out and just notice verses 1 through 6. We see Jesus sending the disciples out to go preach the gospel and pray for those who are sick. In verses 10 through 17, we read about Jesus doing that incredible miracle of feeding 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. And then in verses 18 through 20, we see Peter acknowledging in this great declaration that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And in response to Peter's acknowledgement, notice verses 21 and 22 when Jesus tells them that he's heading off to Jerusalem. He's going to go suffer many things. He's going to be rejected by the Jewish religious leaders, but he's going to rise again from the dead three days later. And then, immediately following that is verse 23, where Jesus looks at the guys around him and he says to him, if anybody wants to come after me. Now you can imagine what's going on here in this moment. They have experienced the exhilaration of doing ministry in Jesus' name. They have seen him feed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. They've heard Peter make this incredible declaration that Jesus is the Son of God. And Jesus in that moment stops him and says, hey, before you get ahead of yourselves, this is where I'm going. If you think this is going to be a mountaintop experience and we're going to be all exhilarated and have warm fuzzies at the end, just know, here's where this is going. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be rejected by many people, and I'm going to die, and I'm going to be raised again from the dead. So then, if you want to follow me, now you'd think at that moment they're all ears. And basically what Jesus gives them is kind of a gospel invitation. If you really want to be a follower of mine, if you really want to know what it means to follow me, here it is. And he lays it out in three key points, and we're going to use those as our first three points of our outline because I want to spend a brief amount of time on each one of them. And you'll notice the first thing that Jesus said is, we are to deny ourselves or deny yourself. If anyone's to come after me, they must deny themselves. Again, knowing the con, you contrast this with our current culture that we live in it's really easy to see, isn't it? Rather than indulge yourself, Jesus says, deny yourself. Rather than love yourself, Jesus says, reject yourself. And in the Greek language, there is, there is some, some understanding that this very well could mean hate yourself. Now, now imagine preaching that in modern day local secular psychology. The best way to true life is to hate yourself. So what does Jesus mean when he says, deny yourself? What does this mean? I mean, we've got to understand it because I, I, I've had people literally tell me, denying yourself means, it's like this as a Christian, if you go to the store and you want to buy a briefcase, if you want a black one, to deny yourself and be really spiritual, get a brown one. That, sound, that sounds really spiritual, you know, I mean, so if I don't want to do something, I do something, that's really denying myself. So we got to understand what Jesus is talking about. And denying ourselves by definition, it means this, that we don't take any stock in our own abilities or our own work ethic to save ourselves or make us right with God. We don't trust in our ability to do anything we can to make ourselves right with God or to gain forgiveness from God. 
See, here's the reality of who we are. If we know these things about ourselves, you'll understand why Jesus says, get rid, deny yourself. In Romans 3.23, Jesus says clearly, or Paul said clearly, we've all sinned against God. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In Romans 7.18, he said, in our flesh, meaning our sinful self, dwells no good thing. Meaning, there's nothing good in your sinful self. And then Jeremiah 17.9 says it very clearly. The Bible tells us that our hearts, the very center of our being, is desperately sick. So when Jesus is talking about ourselves, he's talking about that. So on the one hand, what Jesus says by telling us to deny ourselves is that we have no ability in and of ourselves to save us from our sin and make ourselves right with God. No ability whatsoever. Our hearts are sick and we've sinned so deeply against God, we cannot save ourselves. Therefore, by denying ourselves or rejecting ourselves and putting our full confidence in Jesus, his life, his death, and his resurrection in our place, we are saying he's the only one who can make us right with God. So on the one hand, you can see the gospel invitation. It's, it's literally, I'm repudiating myself from any understanding that I can save myself. But there's another side of this for the Christian. So after we've turn to Christ, we know something else. Just like we learned last week in Romans 6, we have the power of God in our union with Christ to deny our sinful selves from rearing their ugly head. And we all know when this happens to us as Christians. In our union with Christ, denying ourselves mean denying our selfish and sinful desires. So just some examples. If we've been sinned against, We have the power in Christ to deny ourselves the desire for revenge and respond in a way that would be forgiving. If we're disrespected, we have the power in Christ to deny ourselves the temptation to get angry and respond in Christ to serve those who've actually disrespected us. See, denying ourselves means... A steady life of turning from trusting ourselves to trusting in Jesus for our present happiness and holiness and our future present happiness and holiness. That's what it means. It means denying ourselves a steady life every day of turning to trust, not in our abilities, but in Christ's ability. The second thing Jesus says is that we're to take up our cross daily. Now, if you've been a Christian for very long, you have heard all sorts of things about this, right? I mean, your rebellious teenager is your cross to bear. Your arthritis is your cross to bear. Your nagging mother-in-law is your cross to bear, right? Not mine. I don't have a nagging mother-in-law. She's here, so I better say that, right? Yeah. John MacArthur, when he was preaching on this sermon, said, I just want you to go back for a moment, or this text, and he, went, he said, I just want you to go back for a moment and realize the Jewish people who heard this had not gone to a Christian life conference to learn about these type of things. So what would they envisioned? Well, here's some thoughts. In the Roman Empire, the form, their form of capital punishment was crucifixion. Some have said that in the 33 years of Jesus' life alone, from zero to 33, that the Roman government probably executed by crucifixion, 32,000 people. That means 1,000 every year. Now, we just went through a year, I think, where we had about four executions, and it was all over the front page everywhere. Well, imagine if it was 1,000. This would be front page news. It would be right in front of you. So for the Jewish people, hearing Jesus make this statement to take up their cross, they're most certainly not thinking about their frustrating husband. They're thinking about death. But they're also thinking about the type of death, an outcast death. Crucifixion was reserved for criminals of the state who in our world have been like the Charles Mansons or the Jeffrey Dahmers of our world. The ones that society really looked at and said, these are the worst of the worst. 
The most prolific, notorious outcasts and criminals were crucified. So when Jesus said, take up your cross, he's talking about picking up an instrument of death and being willing to carry it and die as an outcast. See, we, we look at crosses as beautiful objects. I mean, like, like the one we have here, you know, it's beautiful, it's, it, you know, there's no splinters in it, it's smooth, or the ones that we wear around our neck that's gold, or we put on our earrings that look pretty, but that's not what Jesus had in mind here. Take up in your heart and in your life a willingness to die as an outcast or a criminal. And notice what he says, he says, do this daily. Take up your cross daily, meaning to be a follower of Christ means we are willing to die daily, regularly, in in season and out of season. We are ready to take up our cross daily. As John MacArthur said in his sermon, so this whole matter of following Jesus is sort of saying no to self and no to safety. I'm willing to bear the reproach of Christ. I'm willing to suffer the consequence of what it is to be a Christian in the environment that I'm in. So so on one side, if you're going to follow Jesus, it, it means that that life of following Jesus is not made up of the world's applause or people's accolades or being the best in class as we have bought into in the American Christian environment that if we just build ourselves up a little bit and look great to the world, they will hear the gospel now. But instead, Jesus is saying, actually, the call to follow me is a willingness to suffer and if necessary, die as an outcast and have the rest of the world look down upon you. So it's important, as Jesus would tell us, before coming to Christ, he says, you you might want to consider the cost that it's going to take. He's saying it potentially could cost you your life. And that's a really good thing for us to pause and think about right now. This world that we are living in, listen, let's be honest, America is not communist China. So everybody let's settle down for a moment. Doesn't mean that we could not get there, but we're not underground, folks. We're still worshiping freely. But the cancel culture, some of the loss of of freedoms that we're seeing, some of the loss of freedom of speech and freedom of religion that are potentially coming our direction mean this could very potentially be a reality for us. We must be willing to take up our crosses daily to follow Christ and be willing to die as an outcast. But there's another side of this taking up our cross I think it's important for us to realize as well. There is to be a daily death in the life of the Christian, daily, where we remind ourselves that in Christ we are dead to sin over the power of sin and we're alive to God. This means that every morning we should reckon ourselves dead to sin and alive to God because we're united in Christ. We we can die to our sinful selves. So Jesus says, if you want to follow me, take up your cross daily. The last thing he says, though, the third thing is, is to follow him. Now when Jewish men followed a Jewish rabbi, they not only learned the religious teaching from the rabbi, but they adopted his lifestyle. And they identified with him as the school that they were under. So you'll read the Apostle Paul an example, and he'll talk about being underneath a teacher named Gamaliel. He was not ashamed to talk about this teacher that he learned under. So when Jesus speaks of following him, it means to not only learn all that he taught, but adopt his lifestyle, his love, his compassion, his, his confrontation of spiritual pride and sin, and his, his forgiveness of other people. But it also means that we identify with him as our rabbi, as our savior and king who has come for us, much like Peter did in Luke 9 when he said, you are the Christ, the son of God. And it means that we identify with his rejection by the spiritual and political elites. It means that we identify with his suffering. It means that we identify with his resurrection, meaning we are literally following an outcast king. To be a follower of Christ means we're completely comfortable 
with identifying ourselves with a crucified yet risen Savior. We believe that His death is for us. And when He died, so did we. It means that when we believe that His resurrection is for us, and when He rose again, we rose with Him to live in a brand new way. That we have the power of God at our disposal to live like Christ now. And we're willing for the sake of our, to, the, to, to stake our lives in this world and in the one to come, that following Jesus is the way to get there. So Jesus is very clear here. If you want to come after him, if you want to be one of his children, if you want to be one of his people, then deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow him. Now here's the question that you look at, you may be wondering, why? If our culture around us says the way to true happiness is loving yourself, why does Jesus say, give up myself and go die for him? How is that the pathway to fulfillment and true life? How is that? Well, that's our last point today. We look at the value and the treasure of Jesus. We're going to see this in verses 24 through 26. You'll notice in these verses, Jesus gives three for statements, so F-O-R, they're like because of statements or so that statements that reveal to us the reason for why we deny ourselves, take up our cross daily and follow Christ. Notice the statements. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of his holy angels. Each statement that you notice is about what we value or what we treasure. Examples. If we value our life, we will lose it. But if we value Christ and lose our life in Christ, we will save it. If we value the profit of the world, prestige, riches, and power, we could lose ourselves. If we're ashamed of Jesus and his words, we don't value them. In the end, he will be ashamed of us. Each of these statements reveals something that is remarkably implied. Jesus is saying there is a life to be gained in Christ that is worth giving up a life that is not in Christ. Jim Elliott, some of you know this famous statement, wrote this in his journal and was found after he passed away from a martyr's death as he was a missionary in South America. And here's what he wrote. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. There is a life to be gained in Christ that is worth giving up a life that will one day be lost. See, these three, these three statements that Jesus says combined, we find something really interesting. We find the reason why we deny ourselves, take up our cross daily and follow Christ. And the reason, the reason is because of the precious value and treasure that Jesus is. See, if, if we treasure and value Christ above everything else, above our own lives, the world's profit and popularity, above acceptance and the rejection of others, what is the natural outflow of that? You will deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow Christ. So I want to explore this for a moment. I want to just draw this thought out about how treasuring Christ affects our humanity now, us, and how it affects us later. Give you three things. These are not going to be on the screen. I'll give them to you as we go and I, so you can write them down. And the first one is this. When we treasure Jesus like this, where we, where we deny ourselves, take up our cross daily and follow Christ, here's what happens. We find true life, happiness, and fulfillment in this life and the one to come. We find true life, happiness, and fulfillment in this life and the one to come. Here, here's why. God made us as humans for him. And he made us to be outwardly focused, to serve other people. So we, we are made to look up to worship God, and we're made to look out to serve other people. 
We were not made to be navel gazers. We're not made to look inward and down. But what does sin do to us? Sin always turns us to us. Just do a little study sometime and just go back in your Bibles. Look at Genesis chapter 3. Notice what immediately happens between Adam and Eve. There's conflict immediately. And then notice the, the very first portrait of the very first family, Cain and Abel. Cain is so selfish that he cannot look beyond the fact that God did not like his sacrifice, but he liked his brother. And filled with rage and anger and disobedience to God, he rises up to do what? To kill his brother. Nothing could be more self-focused. Sin turns us to us. And this is the reason why we are sinful and angry and sad and depressed. Because we are always looking internally. But Jesus came to do something fascinating. He came to live perfectly for God and for us and in our place. He came to die so that we would no longer be separated from God and also that we would be freed from the tyranny of living for ourselves. He came, in a sense, to pick our heads up from looking down and in to looking out and up once again. He came to make us live and restore us to live the way God originally intended it. He came to help us live by no longer living for ourselves, but living for him who died and was raised. And the result, the fruit of that, is that we're really happy and joyful in our lives. It's one of the fruit of the Spirit, as a matter of fact. Listen, ha happiness is not this internal feeling that you have to conjure up by making yourself happy. No, happiness is a response to the way you're living. And the saddest most miserable people are those who think they don't love themselves enough and go to work harder at loving themselves. If you want some proof of this, for a moment, do some research on how many Instagram or YouTube influencers that we lost last year due to suicide. And ask yourself a question, why is it that so many young actors and actresses end up dying of drug overdoses? Because the accolades of the world are not enough to make me happy. But the happiest people the, are the ones who love God and serve others, and in so doing, they find true love for themselves because they see themselves more clearly. This is one of the things I do when people ask me to do marriage counseling. One of the first things I ask them to do is, hey, could you open your Bible with me to Philippians chapter 2? Because I want to talk to you about the pathway to true happiness in your marriage. And it's not from you getting satisfaction from your spouse. It comes from you helping your spouse find their satisfaction in God. And you will find remarkable joy when you reach out to serve them rather than begging them to serve you and being mad that they're not. So we go to Philippians 2 because Paul says Philippians 2, do nothing out of selfishness or vain conceit, but in humility consider others more important than yourself. And then he gives the example of Jesus. So we find true life and happiness and fulfillment when we treasure Jesus enough to deny ourselves, take up our cross daily and follow him. The second thing that I think happens is when we treasure Jesus like this, we become truly human. One of my historical heroes is Jonathan Edwards, and, and Pastor Edwards had a funny way of thinking about things, but one of the things that was interesting was he thought this way. Christians, of all the people in the world, have had an experience with the living God that allows them to truly live as true humans, unlike non-believers, because Christians see the God of the universe behind everything. And so we can experience great joy in food. We can work hard because we see the God of heaven who's behind it all. And we live this truer life than anybody else has. He even mentions that our senses can be enlivened because of the work of God in our life. See, when we think of denying ourselves or not loving ourselves, our tendency is we think we're becoming less human, like a clone. And I, and I see this a lot when we... You talk about Christian people doing certain things. We think that Christian people have to talk a certain way, act a certain way, speak a certain way. But in reality, what the work of the gospel is doing 
It is God taking you, made in his image in distinct and unique ways, and he's shaping you to represent him in this world in ways that only you can, not as a clone. He is making you truly human. See, the reality is when we treasure Jesus enough to deny ourselves and follow him, we're taking the pathway of becoming truly human. Now, if you don't believe that, let me let another historical hero, C.S. Lewis, speak about this because he wrote about this in Mere Christianity. Two quotes that I think really sum this up. He said this, God made us, invented us as a man invents an engine. A car is made to run on petrol, and it would not run properly on anything else. Now, God designed the human machine to run on himself. He himself is the fuel our spirits were designed to burn, or the food our spirits were designed to feed on. There is no other. That is why it is just no good asking God to make us happy in our own way without bothering about religion. God cannot give us a happiness and a peace apart from himself because it's not there. But then he goes on to write, I am not in my natural state nearly so much of a person as I like to believe. Most of what I call me can be easily explained. It is when I turn to Christ, when I give myself up to his personality, that I first begin to have a real personality of my own. There is no real personalities anywhere else. Until you've given yourself to him, you, have not, you will not have a real self. Now here's what this means. The best version of yourself is found in Jesus. The best route to truly understanding yourself and loving yourself, as the world would say, is through loving Christ. The best way for you to do you is to trust in Jesus. And in reality, you have not really lived until you've given your life to Christ. So when we treasure Jesus, we become truly human. But lastly, when we treasure Jesus like this, what Paul, what Jesus is telling us is the best really is yet to come. So we think of denying ourselves and being willing to die. We, we worry that we're going to lose too much. I've talked to people that they say, man, I, I don't know, man. The cost is just, I don't know what's going to, I mean, I mean do I, am I going to lose my 401k? Would I lose my business? What, what does that mean to follow Jesus? Would that happen? And my response is maybe. Maybe. But I think Scott Hubbard said something in a blog post I read this week that I think is really helpful. And here's what he said. You may lose yourself when you give, up, you give yourself up to Christ. But only those parts of yourself that deserve to be lost. The parts that will be torn apart and thrown into the lake of fire. Do you see how freeing that is? See, much of our challenge is that when we think about coming to Christ, we're talking about, and, and, and what he does in us, we're looking for our best life now. We want everything in this life to make sense. We want to be satisfied. We want the greatest experiences. But if you've ever visited with somebody that's looking eternity in the face, you'll see how short-sighted you really are. Because their perspective is way different. See, well, treasuring Christ doesn't, does bring us great joy now. The truth is, it's not the end of the joy. The best of life is yet to come. Literally, we could lose all that this world has for us because we're following Jesus, and in the end, it will all be worth it. Friends, there's not one Christian in heaven right now who's regretting giving up their life for Christ. Not one. So here's what I would challenge you. I would ask you to think through. Treasure Christ so deeply that you deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow him. That's what it means to be a child of God. That's what it means. It means our belief means come hell or high water, I'm following Jesus. 
this world, this kindred can go. But not Christ. That's what it means. Come to Christ knowing that only he can restore your true humanity. See, listen, you, listen young people in our world especially, listen, your world is feeding you a lie that life is found in you, and it's not. True life is found in Christ, and in coming to Christ and giving yourself to Christ, you find yourself. And in following him, knowing this, your eternal destiny is at stake. This world, if you're a child of God, is the worst you will ever experience. That means if you're not a child of God, this world is the best you will ever experience. Boy, that's sad. That's why the call is so clear. If you don't know Christ, you need to come to Christ. You need to turn to Christ. Repent of your sin and yourself and look to Jesus as the only one who can bring you to God and forgive you of your sin. If you're in Christ, listen, you, you should be asking, do you, do you value Jesus like this? I'll let C.S. Lewis close this, and here's what he wrote. Give up yourself and you will find your real self. Lose your life and you will save it. Submit to death, death of your ambitions and favorite wishes every day and death of your whole body in the end. Submit with every fiber of your being and you will find eternal life. Keep back nothing. Nothing that you have not given away will be really yours. Nothing in you that has not died will ever be raised from the dead. Look for yourself, and you will find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. That's a really sad list, isn't it? But look for Christ, and you will find him, and with him, everything else thrown in. Let's pray. Maybe as we're praying right now, the Lord's doing business with you and he's stirring you about your own sin, the things that you have valued above Christ, your unwillingness to deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow him. And right now, God's just putting his finger on those things. And, and would you just do business with God right where you're at? Perhaps you're not a Christian and you have realized you, you need to put your trust in Jesus. And we would just encourage you to pray and to ask God to forgive you. Tell him that you believe in Jesus as your Savior and your King. And you want to give your life to him. Maybe this morning you're disillusioned with God. You, you feel like, man, it's, you know what, I've given up my life and I'm waiting for him to pay me back. And this morning you, you need to repent of your pride. Because in reality, you are serving yourself while trying to serve God. Claiming it is serving God. Father, would you, would you open our eyes to where we breathe the air of self and we live in it so often? And would you breathe in us and give to us a treasuring and a valuing of Jesus? that we reject our sinful selves, that we take up our cross daily and we follow Christ, that we're willing to die as an outcast, as a criminal, that we're willing to identify ourselves with this risen king. Father, only you can truly shepherd your people to you. So deal with our hearts. Help us to represent you well in this world. In a world that is filled with self, help us to bring the reality of true humans submitted to the living God, living joyfully free lives. And may we declare this gospel 
Because it is, it is truly the gospel that sets us free. Let me pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand.